I will try and make this as entertaining and informative as I can in half an hour. I'm going to try and tell you everything I know about lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender issues in about 23 minutes um, that should equip you for everything you need to know. But I might move off that topic a little bit and talk more generally about leadership, about cultural change, about that thing called diversity that costs a lot but is never fulfilled. I will talk a little bit about what I've observed in my time at Stonewall working with over 750 organisations. And I will try and talk a little bit about what we've learnt during the last decade about why identity and who you are is really, really important. So Stonewall was set up 27 years ago in response to something called Section 28. Section 28 was a piece of legislation that prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools. There was a really uh, poor quality book called Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin. And in the book Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, Jenny lives with her dad Eric and his boyfriend Martin. Already that was considered to be quite controversial. 40 pages of interminable dullness um, where Jenny goes to the park and goes to the shops and goes to school. About halfway through the book, Jenny is seen getting into bed with Eric for what we call in Wales a morning kutch. And what that means, getting in for a cup of tea. And that was considered to be so dangerous and so likely to convert an entire generation of young people to become rampant homosexuals, the decision was made to ban the book. Now, those of you who have any inkling of the History Channel will know that banning books never entirely works out well on social change, but a whole generation of young people were consigned to reading books like Cinderella, books that showed exactly what girls should do in the world, exactly what boys should do in the world. And despite this indoctrination, I still managed to turn out gay, but I'm sure that many people were saved from that ignominy. Now, that came in the 80s, and what was happening in the 80s, we were seeing considerable change around race and gender, but around sexual orientation, we seemed to take a massive step back. Compounded, of course, by HIV and AIDS. We'd seen something hit a generation of young men that completely and utterly decimated the lesbian and gay community. And the government, the state at the time, didn't know what to do about it, except demonise a generation of men for who they are, rather than help them or try and stop the spread of this terrible, terrible illness. The generation before that had been told that who they were was completely and utterly unacceptable, and people, as you know better than I do, were persecuted, imprisoned, arrested, often on fabricated charges, just for who they are. So I share that with you, not to kind of like lower the tone, but to give some insight into the history and legacy that is shared by the lesbian, gay and bisexual community. What was happening with trans people at that time is that for a long time there was no legislation at all affecting trans people. If you were rich enough, powerful enough, had enough access to different things, you could change your gender and nobody would really care. Then, one day, a woman took her husband to court to divorce him, was trying to secure a much larger settlement, and the judge said, hold on a minute, you're not a woman, your marriage is completely invalid. And from that moment, everybody who had subtly and quietly transitioned were suddenly told that wasn't allowed at all. And so a sexual orientation campaign developed called Stonewall, and a trans campaign developed called Press for Change. And it was down to social society to try and move those barriers and change those attitudes. And it's been a long old journey but in fact, no time at all. So from the 1997 onwards, I'm sure I don't need to articulate what happened in 1997. Stonewall is a completely non-partisan organisation. I'm sure it's a complete coincidence that after 1997, we saw massive legislative change for lesbian, gay and bisexual people and trans people. But what happened from 97 to 2007 was a decade of huge change, where every single law was passed that means that LGBT people have full equality. And what happened in our institutions, our workplaces, is they had to catch up too. And what we saw in the police forces in Stonewall was a, was a sector that was absolutely shocked and shaken by the McPherson report, anxious about what these words meant, institutional prejudice, institutional discrimination, and I would argue a sector that became utterly frozen, very concerned about everything they couldn't do, are not too empowered about what they might do. 
There was huge institutional guilt about what was clear failures in policing, that a failure to understand the true diversity and complexity of communities needed to be addressed, but the McPherson report didn't really give you the tools that you needed to make those changes. So what was Stonewall doing around that time? Well, Stonewall was growing. So when I joined Stonewall in 2005, as a 24-year-old with short hair and baggy jeans and 20 Marlboro lights, uh, Stonewall was working with 50 organisations. We had 25 staff, a turnover of about 1.3 million. Now, Stonewall has never taken money from government. Um, we pretend that's a principle, but to be honest, it was never offered. So... <laughs> We're very pleased that we've never taken money from government. And since that time, we've grown to 100 staff and 6.6 .6 million turnover. And now, instead of working with 50 staff, we work with 750 employers. Those 50 employers in the old days were police forces, a handful of private sector organisations who didn't want anyone to know, and a couple of other organisations who were just ready to start talking about the gay thing. And it really was just starting to talk about the gay thing. In 2016, we see those 750 and a much more sophisticated understanding of diversity, what we mean by positive action, what we mean by changing culture. There is a more comfortable dialogue that goes on. But there are five stages of organisation that we see at Stonewall, and I'm just going to outline those to you now. The first stage of organisation we see, and they're the ones that I work with, so over the last decade at Stonewall, I've held a lot of positions, and I'm now in the privileged position to be chief executive, and that means I've seen things that you know one shouldn't see but once you're chief executive you've got to re really deal with the people who really hate gay people so my job is to deal with the people who really hate gay people and you see them and you say do you have any gay staff and they say absolutely not and you say archbishop of canterbury do you have any gay staff <laughs> and he says well we might do but they haven't done anything gay so i go okay and uh, so so we work on that basis the second stage of organisation, do you have any gay staff? Yes, and we've spoken to them and he's very happy. <laughs> here is our gay member of staff. He really loves working here. He's never experienced any prejudice, never experienced any homophobia. Um, you know, the women love him. Uh, he's, he's really fun to be around and generally I think we're really good with this Stonewall. So, so we don't need your help just now because this is working really well third stage of organisation, do you have any lesbian and gay staff? We, we bring in the women at this stage. Yes, we have an LGBT network group and the three guys go to the pub once a week and talk about how hard it is to be gay and we listen to that really seriously because we want all our staff to be okay and we're really worried that it must be really hard to be gay. It's really hard. And we go, well, it can be hard but it doesn't have to be. Sometimes people are really happy if they're gay and that's okay too. And we do a little bit of moving gay people away from a slightly kind of communal therapy oak procession into something more constructive. Fourth stage of organisation, do you have any LGBT staff? Yes, we've got a great lesbian who's just completed the Workplace Equality Index, um, so we're really raring to go on that. Her day job is actually fixing the photocopiers, but she's really driving this through. And HR are really grateful because basically the LGBT staff are looking after that. And that's where we see most organisations. And we give them a bit of budget for their teas and coffees, and they're ever so grateful. And they're really forging through. The problem with that, of course, is that you always end up with someone who's the gay one, when actually they just want to be really good at fixing photocopiers. They end up really resenting the amount of work they're doing in their spare time. And they get what we call, and it's a technical phrase, gayed out. And they basically end up becoming a bit of a trade union in your organisation. And they become the person who has to vocalise all the things that are going wrong with diversity. And they quickly lose the respect of the hierarchy and senior staff because they're not doing their day job very well. So we really go for the fifth option. And the fifth option is really exciting. And that's where it becomes actually about how you work and who you are. And we use sexual orientation and gender identity to talk about that, but actually everything we're talking about is applicable across all diversity strands. Who you are is incredibly important. And the reason why LGBT people have something valuable to say about who they are is because they have to make a decision in every single new interaction to decide whether they're going to tell you who they are. 
They have to work out whether it's going to be a big deal or a small deal, whether they have to make a big fuss or a small fuss, whether they should sprinkle it into the conversation, whether they should correct your assumption, whether they should unfurl a rainbow flag, whether they should make a political statement. How are they going to let you know who they are? And that is a decision that LGBT people have to make pretty much constantly. However secure they are, however at ease they are with their soul, and it's a decision that starts, first of all, with needing to tell their mum and dad, or their friends, or their employer, or even their spouse, there's a moment when they are willing to risk everything in order to be who they are. And taking that risk teaches LGBT people something fundamental about integrity and about values. Because they make the decision that it is more important to be themselves than it is to lie. We do a huge amount of work with the Secret Service. And what the Secret Service have realised is that if their LGBT staff feel able to be themselves in the workplace and are given the space to be themselves, they are more likely to challenge when they think that something is happening that shouldn't. And the reason why they work with us is not because they want to be seen to be great at the gay thing, but because they know that there's something they can tap into about integrity that will improve the outcomes of operational decisions. And I want you to just keep that in your mind, because I'm going to go more into that in a moment. But LGBT people have something to tell you about what it is not being themselves. And when I do exercises in conferences in the morning, I suggest that you spend the day using the opposite pronouns of your partner than the ones they are. If you spend the day either avoiding talking about who your partner is or pretending they're the person, an opposite person, you will miss about 50% of the content. I guarantee. You will not hear what's going on if you are double thinking every space. However, LGBT people who are able to assess quickly and almost subconsciously whether it's safe to be able to be themselves are really good emotionally tuned in to groups and group dynamics. That's another thing the spies have worked out. Gay people make better spies because they're able to suss out a room quickly, whether it's safe or whether it's not. And where people are in terms of their dynamics and their energy. Is this an aggressive situation? Is this a calm situation? How can I de-escalate this? All that reading of a room happens because at the age of seven, you're other, not because your trainers are crap, but because you're a boy who stands out by not being like the other boys. You learn how to navigate otherness. Now, at Stonewall, we know that people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds are navigating that otherness continually. We know that disabled people are navigating that otherness continually. But what LGBT people can do is articulate that in a different way because they can hide it. And by hiding it, they gain some insight into what it is to not be able to be yourself. So we explore this in detail with lots and lots and lots of LGBT people. We run massive leadership programs. We do all this kind of work. And after two and a half days, even those who say, well, I've got no problem being gay, I'm out in every single setting, realize that they do something to make who they are a bit more acceptable. Young men, particularly when we run this with teenagers, say, yeah, OK, I've got no problem being gay. I've been out for ages, but I don't want to be too gay. I don't want anyone to think that I'm a bit too camp or a bit too effeminate. I want to make sure I look straight and act straight. I don't mind being gay. I don't mind people knowing that, but I don't want them to judge me for being too gay. Lesbians, you know, I don't want to be too butch. I don't want to be too angry. I don't want to be too this. I want to be a very good gay. We talk about good gay a lot. And when we work with bigger groups, what emerges then is that's what other groups think too. And what women, heterosexual women, start talking about is being a good woman, not spending too much out with their children, the car might break down, that's an acceptable excuse for being late. The kid being sick the second time in a row, that's not an acceptable excuse for being late. People change who they are in order to fit in. And there's something very powerful about LGBT people sharing that experience. So when we think about authenticity, about who we are, that then applies to you heterosexual men as well. Who you are, really who you are, is more important than you can ever imagine. When I was doing this work with a group of, of guys, a guy stood up and said, I just want to say that last year I left my wife and it was the worst six months of my life. And I didn't tell any of you about it because I thought it was private and personal, but I was an absolute twat to work with. And I just want to say I'm really sorry about that and I should have just told you what was going on. Because the reality is who you work with 
are, if not your friends, they certainly know a hell of a lot about you. And if you're in a bad place, if something's going on, if you've got something on your mind, if you've got something distracting you, that gets in the way of your ability to be an effective leader. And so what LGBT people have taught us is that the more we can bring ourselves to work, the more honest we can be, the more that speaks to our values and who we are and what we do. That way, we can break the cycle where we keep recruiting people who look like us, think like us, act like us, even when we're pretending to be something that we're not. So here's a bit of science for you. Number one, unconscious bias is a load of rubbish, and anybody who tries to sell you really expensive courses on unconscious bias, tell them no thank you. Unconscious bias is just an excuse to get you in a room so you can be a little bit racist and not feel bad about it, okay? <laughs> Forget unconscious bias. More important biases, and I promise you don't have to pay a lot of money to learn this because it's not a complex concept, is something called affinity bias. Affinity bias is where, when you interview, when you hang out with a group, you are immediately attracted, and I don't mean this in a Keith Faust way, immediately <laughs> attracted to people who think, act, work like you. You like surrounding yourself with people who get you. You like surrounding yourself with people who understand what you're asking for within one sentence. You like someone who shares your enthusiasm and your vision. You like someone who will run alongside you. That is absolutely natural. It is a human instinct in a position of leadership, and you are all in incredibly important positions of leadership, to surround yourselves with people who think like you, act like you, work like you. It's what we do. It's what Theresa May has just done. It's what any leader does. If you take one thing away from this conversation, it's this. Affinity bias only should exist in Tinder. <laughs> that is the only time when you should have affinity bias, when you are deciding to date or you're deciding to marry someone. Then it is perfectly acceptable to have a bias against someone who thinks like you, acts like you, and really gets you, gets all of you. When you're recruiting and surrounding yourselves with people who you want to work with you, you should do everything you can to challenge your affinity bias and surround yourself with people who don't immediately think like you, act like you, work like you. Because the trick about affinity bias is when you do it, you then have what we call confirmation bias. So you recruit someone who's just like you. They probably have the same weaknesses as you, but you overlook that. Then they do the thing that you've asked them to do brilliantly, and then you go, you see, they're amazing. I was so right to appoint them because they've done exactly what I want them to do just like I want them to do it. That way, you create culture after culture after culture of people who think, look, act, and work the same way. And you reassure yourselves with your Benetton advert of a table of your leaders and go, look, we've got a gay one, we've got a BME one, and we've got this one. They are all thinking and acting and working in the same way. And the reason why that goes wrong is because people who are emulating your style of leadership because they want you to like them are never going to be as effective leaders as you are. So they are going to hit that glass ceiling way before you did. And thus, you will continue to perpetuate the notion that only people who look like you, act like you, think like you are capable of being successful. So the force will look the same in the next decade, in the next two decades, in the next three decades. The only way you can break this is by changing the people you bring around you. We're lucky at Stonewall. We have a lot of LGBT staff, but our heterosexual staff are very good too. <laughs> the LGBT staff have given us a way of thinking about those values that has been incredibly important. So my message to you today is start challenging yourself on affinity bias, but also take the risk. Break it. See if you can rebuild it. See if you can rebuild a different way of making decisions, a different way of working. Next time you intuitively want to pull someone into the room, pull someone else in as well. It may not work all the time. It may get a bit annoying. But you have to start looking beyond your peripheral vision if you are going to change the culture. And you are in a position of incredible power and influence. If you start role modeling that different way of behaving, that will filter down. It'll filter down throughout the entire force, because even at the most junior levels, they will start bringing in people into those decisions who may not have ordinarily been in that room. And in that way, you start making better decisions, better operational decisions, because you're not seeing everything through one scope and one perspective. And that's what diversity is all about. Diversity is all about making sure you have more than one perspective on a team. And the more you can do to enable that and encourage that, 
from your position of leadership, the better. This agenda is highly politicised. It forces you into knee-jerk activity and number crunching that makes you feel like you're doing something that you ought to be doing. It's not changing your way of thinking. So please, change your way of thinking on this and you will reap the rewards even though it's difficult. And I promise you, your LGBT staff have a way of thinking and talking about these issues that you are missing out on. So tap them up, tap them in, but don't make them do all the work. Thank you very much.